She didn't always do that. She typically didn't lay anything out. She typically didn't leave the house, but this time she'd laid it out the day before, and she'd made sure that, that it was as inconspicuous as possible, something that really wouldn't call much attention, something that she could basically slip by in, and she paid most attention to a scarf that she would wrap around her head and maybe even partially over her face. She looked at herself in this little mirror she had by the door. She didn't have much time. She knew that the sun was going to rise pretty soon. She wanted to get out before then. She wanted to get out as early as possible. By the way, did we cut off the opportunity where you guys sit in the pews? Um, it, was not enough it just occurred to me that you guys are stuck on the stage <laughs> the rest of the time. She wanted to get out there as early as she could. She had a little ways to go and not much time. She knew that. So she opened a door and she struck out. Not quite sunrise. She's walking and walking. She had to go from the outskirts of town into town and then across town all the way to the shore. And as she got there, she saw that she should have left a little bit earlier. She looked across this crowd of people and she saw that there were already too many there and that he was already stepping off of the boat and that he was already stepping onto land and that people are, were already pressing in. And as she was watching, she thought, maybe I can still do this, maybe I can still slip in. But as she's still watching, she sees that on the other side of this crowd, a man's coming along. And he approaches the crowd and the crowd begins to part for him. And he walks all the way to the center where he meets him. And that's where our story picks up. If you are with us in your Bibles today, we're in Mark 5. If you're not in your Bibles with us today, that's strange because we're at a Christian worship service. So there's Bibles right in front of you in your pews. So grab those, pull them out because we're going to read them together. You guys just heard most of the story read from the front, but we're going to dive into it. Um, if you don't want to reach down at that book, just open up your flat screen Swipe over to Mark 5, and we're in verse 21. And when she got there that day, when she approached that part of town, this is what she sees. A crowd had gathered around him. And then one of the synagogue rulers, a man named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. So not only does she see that she's behind the crowd, not only does she see that there's already a mass of people around him and that he's already arrived and that he's already stepped off and that there's already somebody else there, but it's not just anybody. It's a synagogue ruler. And she knows when it comes down to him or me, it's going to be him. So she sees, and Jairus comes and he falls at his feet and he pleads with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And Jesus goes with him. She knows that it's been 12 years now of suffering. She knows that maybe she should have gotten up a little bit earlier, but she had farther to go than most of these people. So when she sees that he starts walking with him, she thinks... This is the only chance I have. She goes for it. She takes a stab at this. And as we go through the text, I've got a few things that I want to talk through with you. First of all, we know that the man that stepped off the boat, that guy's name is what? Jesus. See, you guys all got that right because you took your Bibles out. Good job. Otherwise, we'd have no idea who this guy is. So Jesus is the guy that steps off. And what's he there for? Like, we know that he came across the water, right? He came to the shore, he steps off the boat, and there's a crowd. What's he doing there? Who's got a shot at this? Who's got an idea? What's Jesus there to do that day? What's that? You said teach. Yeah, he did that sometimes, right? Like he'd go places, and, and there'd be people that gathered around, and he would, what would he teach him about? Like what, what, what does Jesus have to teach? A lot of you guys are mouthing stuff, like I'm like Superman. Yes. God's love. Okay, he did like to talk about God's love. We've got a whole 
sermon in a different gospel, same chapter, right? Matthew 5, all the way through 7. And that's one long sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount because he was on a little hill. And, and we call it that, but that's all about God's love. So he would teach. Like, that's one thing he was there to do, right? He was there to teach. And, and so when he comes off the boat and he sees a huge crowd of people, that's probably pretty encouraging, right? I mean, Pastor Phil tells me, like, I wish there were more people. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it's cool. When you walk into the sanctuary on Sunday and you're going to talk about God's love, right? If you're going to talk about that, you want people to hear that. You don't want to just be talking to, to an empty room or a, like an empty coastline. So he sees this and he's got this idea. Maybe today I can teach a lot of people about this awesome thing called God's love. Does he get to do that that day? No, Maddie, you shook your head. Why? What does he do instead? Okay, so like, like so, so in this particular case, you say like he went to help people. How did this unfold? So he's standing there, there's a crowd, and that's good news, right? Like that's what we want. Like how, how awesome would it be for you all if I just walked out right now? Right? Like, hey guys, I've got to go help my buddy. Peace. Right? That's not, <laughs> you would think, like that's a squandered opportunity, right? There's a whole bunch of people here. They're sitting in the pews, mind you. There's not even comfortable chairs. Like we came in and we're sitting in pews and this guy just took off. That doesn't seem right. But what does Jesus start to do? And what's he doing here? What, what, what were we just read to? He's, he, he's leaving, right? He's, ba- he's leaving the sermon, that's, he, he got to the point in the story where they already did the welcome and announcements, they already did the opening worship set, they handed out bulletins, and now he's at the point where he's going to talk, and he starts to walk away. <laughs> I just thought that was really funny. <laughs> but but, but that's, that's the thing he does, and I started thinking, how is it that that works? And, and so I read through other stories like this, and it's not infrequent that he comes to a place, either enters a town or steps off a boat onto a shore, and typically there's a formula to it, right? And SHF, I say this all the time there. I think you guys should probably recite it, right? Like, like tell us the formula. What's this, the formula to a Jesus story? How's it go? Oh, you got to the end. Wait, let's, let's go first. First, Jesus shows up, and then what? A crowd gathers, very good. And then what happens? Distraction, right? And how often does Jesus go with a distraction? Almost all the time. In fact, we don't have a story in the entire four Gospels collectively where there is a crowd, a distraction enters from the side, and Jesus chooses to stay with the crowd. It's interesting how much I tend to focus in my Christian life and in my ministry on getting to those pre-scheduled things. And if distractions show up, I put them aside until I get through the Bible study, until I get through the FOI meeting, until I get through the mission trip, until I get through the worship on Sunday morning, until I get through the boat, like everything that we have to do that consumes our time as a church and me as a staff person. And then later, sometimes days later, if I remember, I think, oh, that's right. That one guy needed my help. And I don't know if that's the way it goes with you. But as I live out my Christianity, it doesn't look like Jesus. I am consumed with the things that are on my calendar as the director of youth programs. And it seems like Jesus' entire ministry was a collection, a string of distractions. Can you picture what our collective church life would be if it were a string of distractions focused primarily on those who approach us because they need something? So he takes us there, and then he goes on, right? Mark goes on from there. So Jesus is walking off, and this woman sees, "Uh uh-oh, this was my one shot. Now, what do we know about this woman? Let's go back to her. What do we know about the woman? Nothing. We haven't gotten to her yet. So we're going to do that right now. Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, and instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched his cloak. So we've got not just one distraction in this story. This story is unique in its formula. This story has all the makings of a Jesus story, Jesus comes into town, steps off the boat, crowd gathers. Distraction number one comes around. But in this story, you have a second distraction. What do we know about her? Wendy, you know, I... You're trying to teach me to read lips. I love it. Okay, bleeding for 12 years, we know that. And what does that mean? (laughs) Okay. And, and, and so, so let's start with that. Bleeding for 12 years, right? Bleeding for 12 years. That in itself is a horrendous thought, right? Like just, just bleeding by itself is, is difficult. But when we're talking about this woman, we're talking about menstrual bleeding, right? That's the scenario that the story takes us into. And we know some stuff about menstrual bleeding in this day and age. What do we know about it? Yeah, And, and what's that based? I don't know if you guys heard. I'll say it just because we record this apparently. Um, she can't hang out with people because she's unclean. Where do we get that from? Why is that the case? Old Testament teaching. Now, a lot of people are saying Old Testament. Apparently you guys like Old Testament. Okay, so Old Testament. And what does the Old Testament say? Okay, part of the culture. Does anybody have the specific the specific, uh, let's say, requirements in the Old Testament around menstrual bleeding. What's that? Oh, you guys are getting into it now. We talk about this and you guys are into it. Yeah, so, so, so there's a cleansing period and what did, what did she have to do? Or what did a, a woman have to do during... There was a ritual cleansing... No relations like sexual relations, right? No sexual relations. Yes. Outskirts of town. Okay, so all of this is right. You nailed it. Good job, Ben, for giving her the answer. So you, na- <laughs> you guys nailed it. There is a ritual that goes with it, and you guys kind of piece some of the components together. If you want to look at it, Leviticus 15 through 20 will tell you a whole bunch of stuff that you don't ever want to read again, but it's in there. So <laughs> I know you guys are all huge fans of Leviticus. Um, book number three. And it tells you things like, during that period of the month, while she's bleeding, she needs to, here's the first thing, leave town and go to a place, a designated place, outside of the walls of the town. I mean, how does that feel? Right? Like, Medfield's a small town. Everybody knows you're like, like, like when, when, you're, when you're going through something, and, this, and let's say it doesn't matter what it is, it makes you so unacceptable that you can't even come into the borders of the town. To us, that's like crazy talk, right? So she had to leave town for seven days during the bleeding. And then if you keep reading in Leviticus and you make it to 20, you find out that then she was to designate a few days after she stopped bleeding seven more days to bathe and cleanse herself. And not only that, but anything that she lays down or sits on needs to be cleansed also. So like a chair, if she lays in a bed, anything like that needs to also be cleansed. And anybody who not only has sexual relations with her, but comes into physical contact with her is also unclean, specifically defiled, I think was the word Tim used. That's what has to happen. And then, to top that off, she's supposed to come back into town, go to a priest, and offer two turtle doves, and if she can't afford the turtle dove, she offers two pigeons. That's the way that that goes, right? So if you think about that for a second, now, spread that reality across how many years? Spread the reality of being socially, religiously unacceptable in the community that you grew up in, in the town that you know, with the friends that you've had, 
the families that saw you as a child, the places where you might have worked, for 12 years, they do not want you near because if they come into contact with you, you've made them too dirty. And you feel that. This is a woman who now comes to a crowd of people smack in the middle of town. And the man that she's trying to get to is on the other side of him. And not only is he on the other side of him, but he is what? He's walking away. Can you like feel the tension and anxiety that's built into the text? 12 years of getting worse. She's got no more money. She's out finding the doctor. So in other words, conducting family business, which means she has no, what? No husband, right? Gosh, SHF is killing it. It's like you guys do Bible study. Um, She's got no husband because otherwise he would be finding the doctor. No money, no husband, no home outside of town. This is the one shot she feels like she has. In 12 years, she comes to him. She realizes that she's a little too late because she had to walk farther than everybody else, right? And when she gets there, she sees he's leaving. So what does she do? What do you do in a situation like that? Yeah. She chases, right? She goes after him. So I'll read that again. When she heard about Jesus, check this out. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Can you guys see that? Let's, let's think that through for a second. What must that have looked like? What did she have to do? How did she achieve this? Let's just, just imagine. It is, after all, a story. You're supposed to imagine. What does she do? What's that? You, you, like, like, you're, like she's like shoving people. She pushes Heidi. She knocks down Steve. She's like, no time for an announcement. I've got to get to Jesus right now, right? Like, is that, like, that's what you're thinking. Like, she's got to get there. You're saying no. No, she does not. She does not push Steve. Stealthy. She goes, she goes, she goes ninja mode. Like, like okay, so let's. Let's, let's describe it. Guys, this is the Bible. You should not be laughing. <laughs> it's the word of God, people. So, so what do you mean? What do you mean stealthy? Uh-huh. Okay, so she's in, she's out. She thinks, like, I can just sneak. What, what, how do you, what do you think of her posture? So I like the stealthy way. I actually kind of like Dan. Like Dan's is cool, but, but the stealthy way might work a little bit better. It's a little more faithful to the story, possibly. How does she do it? How does she get through? So she can't be recognized, so hence the boom, right? So Because if people recognize her, what? Well, wait, wait, wait. Would they push her away? Right? They can't push her away, can they? Lou. Interesting. So you've got the scenario now where she's trying to get to him, last hope possibly, because she's out of money, she's desperate, she's out of options. She sees the crowd, he's leaving, following the synagogue ruler. She knows she's not going to make an argument, so she thinks, I've just got to get up there and touch the cloak. Maybe, just maybe, that would do it, right? And so she goes into this stealth mode, pulls the scarf down, and she starts weaving through. And then what, what Kathy and Lou said, think that through for a second, picture that. What is the story telling us? What does it mean to us that she's weaving through and people are not parting away like they did for Jairus, right? But as they see, oh my gosh, it's that woman that shouldn't be in town, they back off. What does that mean for us? Yeah. Say that one more time. Okay, so she, she's doing this no matter what. There is nothing that's going to get in her way. So it tells us something about her, right? She's got something that's driving her to Jesus regardless of obstacles. Okay, we know that about her. What else does this tell us? 
So not only like physical obstacles where there's like Steve in the way and like shoving, like there's also the emotional, psychological, spiritual component of this whole thing, right? Because, I mean, she's been put through the ringer for 12 years. Every time that she needs eggs, right? Every time she needs anything and has to go into town. That's got to be a traumatic experience. So she puts that aside and it, she lets that drive her to Jesus. Let's picture the, the, the actual motion for a second. Who here, like, really, really likes watching movies? Yeah, the rest of you guys are alive. Like, we, we all, like, movies are awesome, right? But some of you guys like thinking about the way the movie was made. Keep your hand up if you like thinking, oh, how did they shoot that scene? They did something cool with the camera there. Okay, cool. Now keep your hand up if while you do that, you also think, I bet you, like, I've got an idea. I bet you that they wrote it out this way. I bet you they directed it this way. I bet you that these were the instructions that he gave the actors and the extras. Like, you like doing that. Okay, those of you that are still raising your hand, if you were to write this out, what's your scene? How do you, how do you create this to be captured on a camera and be displayed across the screen. How do you direct this and write it? What do you do? You're still raising your hand, so I'm just going to... George, I assume you've got it. So... <laughs> okay, so you... Nice, nice, like a pan shot. So you need a drone, right? Like you're doing a drone shot. Okay, go on. Happy Father's Day. Okay, go on. Okay. Wait, what, what, what are the two entities? Okay, so, so, so Jesus and the woman, you said come at each other, right? Okay. 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 So you, okay, so you've got a bunch of components now, right? You've got Jesus, and he's moving in one direction. Let's just assume he's going that way, towards Park Street Books, right? Which way is, where is she, and which way is she moving? Okay, so she's like over here, maybe, right? And, and she's trying to cut across incognito to him. Okay, and then you mentioned the masses. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. They step back. Now, is the stepping back extra dramatic or is it just like they're standing there and suddenly they move aside? What were they doing before? They were pushing in, right? Did you guys read the... Christy articulated that. She actually emphasized that and I really like that. They weren't just following Jesus, right? It wasn't like us where we like to follow from a distance. Like they were pressing in on him and, and to some degree, maybe even impeding process, which is probably making dad, happy Father's Day, everybody, dad super nervous because his daughter's at the point of death, right? Like there's this whole other story that's happening in the background. And so they're pressing in on Jesus. So theologically, let the motion of the story drive your interpretation of the theology here. What is going on? What do these different components point to? And if I'm not looking at you guys and you want to answer, just call out. Um, what's it point to? Yeah. Interesting. I don't know if you guys heard that. That was incredible. I'm not even going to tell you. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Chloe Rogan says that as he's leaving, Jesus leaving, he's following this father who's out there trying to save his daughter like a good father should, right? And he's getting anxious because people are pressing in and slowing down the one hope that he has for his daughter. And these people want to be there. They want to press in because isn't that what we do? Isn't that what, what, what Christians do when they think Jesus or God is going to do something amazing? We show up for that, don't we? And we want the first row seat. That's when we'll sit like in the front pews. Like we show up, we want to be part of it because tomorrow we don't want to be the one that missed out. 
We don't want to be the one that says, yeah, God did something amazing and I wasn't part of it. We want to press in and be as close to Jesus as we possibly can until, until being close to Jesus means being close to the people that we consider unacceptable. Until pressing in on God and being up against him and being in the front rows and being on the front lines of ministry means that we have to rub up against people that we think are dirty, defiled, disgusting, gross, awkward, right? And so in the motion, the very motion that Mark lays out in the story, we have a deep theological concept that if we want to be close to God, on the front lines of where God's spirit is moving, then we have to be perfectly okay with coming into contact with the people that nobody else wants to touch. And that's what Christian ministry looks like. The more we back away from those who are socially, spiritually, physically, ethnically, rejected, those on the margins of society, those who are oppressed, those who are looked down on, those who are thought to be unacceptable in our pews or on our streets, the more that we back off from them, the more that we back off from God, no matter how often we show up to church. That's what the motion of the story lays out. And I think the motion lays out one more thing. She'd suffered a great deal, and she came up behind him and thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus realized that power had gone from him. Have you guys ever noticed that when we're faced with so many needs in our world, you open the newspaper, or you turn on your TV, and you see hurricane here, earthquake here, but I've got a friend over here that's losing a parent, and I've got a child who needs help with homework. We just feel like we're super stretched, right? Have you ever felt like if you've got a need in front of you and a need behind you, suddenly some power leaves you? This guy felt everything we do. He felt that power had left him. And he turned around and he said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said, that's a dumb question. There's a crowd pressing in on you. Bless you. Why do you ask who touched my clothes? Of course, everybody's touching your clothes. But he ignored them. He just kept looking around to see who'd done it. The woman, knowing what happened to her, came and fell at his feet with fear and trembling. Right? Because did her bleeding stop? Yeah. Yeah. Why is she still afraid? Right. So her bleeding stopped. But what did Jesus want to do? Why did he call her forward in front of everybody? Because he knew that bleeding was only half the story. I wonder how often we address this immediate thing that we see in people, and then as soon as we put a Band-Aid on that, we think, okay, that's done, we're good to go, when really there is depth to the needs that they have. Jesus is concerned about the whole package. So he calls her up, and she comes before him, falls at his feet, in fear and trembling, and he says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While he was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and said, Your daughter's dead. Boom. Let's pray. No. (laughs) Happy Father's Day again. What just happened? Like, I know you may have read ahead, and I know he's Jesus, so he's got an advantage, so he can go take care of the dead thing. But in the story, in Jairus' mind, what just, what just happened? Right. And what do we do with that? 
Have you been there? When you're hoping against hope that God's going to come through for you, and then you see him working in somebody else's life, and you think maybe if he just stopped to help me, it would have gone well for me too. Have you guys been there? Where it seems like he's just delaying and delaying and delaying, and the opportunity slipping, and it's dissipating by the second. We've been there. What is this telling us? I don't know, but I have an idea. I am always so concerned with preparation for the trip that I'm about to take to serve a bunch of people somewhere else. I put hours into it, fundraising, t-shirt design, meetings, prep sessions, read books, because somewhere out there, people are going to benefit from that. I'm going to help them. And as I do that, I often don't even notice the people that are sitting around me and the depth of their need. And Jesus doesn't seem to do that. Jesus seems to stop and acknowledge there's a woman right here who I already have contact with because she snuck up behind me and touched my cloak. And while I know that there's this other thing over here that I need to get to, I have a responsibility to the people in my immediate sphere. So as we prep for Puerto Rico and mission trips in the future and college and career and all these great things that we're going to do, I wonder how often we miss the people that are sitting right behind us just trying to touch our cloak and we just keep walking. So as we prep, all of you wearing t-shirts that say Puerto Rico 2018, and all of you praying for us, I wonder if this week we can think through, what are we leaving unnoticed? What are we overlooking? Who are we ignoring, neglecting, as we think through these grand schemes of church missions? Who's right around us that really needs our help also? That's where I find myself. And I think that's the way that Jesus lays out a strategy for ministry. I would love for SHF to mean everything that it does now and for us to prep for places like Puerto Rico that were devastated by hurricanes. But at the same time, SHF has to mean that in Medfield, there aren't people that sit ignored and alone at lunch tables in the cafeteria. And it has to mean that younger siblings aren't neglected as they try to aspire for what their older siblings accomplished. And it has to mean that people who are oppressed and ignored and unwelcome in our churches of high school age don't have to go to substance abuse to find relief from that. They can come into our doors on some Sunday evenings. And not just Sunday evenings, but they can come to your doors anytime they need it. That's what SHF ought to mean that we know what's going on around us, immediately behind us, who's trying to crawl their way through to God and just can't seem to get there. I don't think we have to give up focusing on Puerto Rico to do that. But when it comes up, we do have to stop. What do you guys think? Well, you're in service. Of course you're going to not. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being a God that deals with us the same today as you did back then. Thank you for being a God that stops and looks around and doesn't put us aside just because you have an end times magnificent scheme ahead of you. Thank you that you focus on our hurts, on our wounds, right where we are. Help us to be the same. Help us to see the people the way you do. Help us to go and serve people that were devastated by hurricanes and famines and war and homelessness, but to also remember that there's kids around our own town that are rejected by all of us because they look different, speak different, talk differently. They don't have the economic resources. They feel like they don't belong because of their identity 
Help us to remember that that is where your eye goes and that is where your heart stays and that we are here to be like you. Amen.